Hello. Hello, how's it going? Hello, Jim, how's it going? I can't hear you. No, you can, right? Yeah, there you go. Oh, there we go. So, how's your week been? Busy. <laughs> Let's see here. Same there. Actually, took a nap before this, so I'm going to wake it up still. All right. Let's see. Let's see, Rubik's map. That's what we want here. Let me blow this sucker up. It's just gonna be you and me today. Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe missing last week kind of threw people off a little bit. What's that now? Maybe missing last week threw people off or something. Ah, oh, no, we got some paper. Oh, uh, yeah, you never know. There we go. Yeah, I guess that's lookable. All right. So, actually, uh, I forgot to mention my roommate. Uh, is needing to quarantine. So for the next two weeks, I'm going to be on Zoom. Um, I'm quarantining as well, just be extra certain. Oh, so well, I mean, uh, it, does, you, does your roommate just need to be quarantined or is, are they showing symptoms? They just need to be quarantined. They're not showing symptoms yet. So right. like, I don't technically speaking need to because I'm probably like, there's no evidence for me having been exposed to it. But just to be certain, I am going to go and stay online for a while. Right, right. Well, I guess that's probably the better part of Valor. Yeah. Oh, here we go. It's already recording. I forgot to set these things to automatically record. Okay, we'll wait a couple more minutes and we'll. Oh. Yeah, I, got, I just got selected for one of those uh, random tests. Right, so I've got to go in next week. Probably get in touch with a few other people. Maybe I should uh, set up a meeting with uh, with Sean. What about a what about a meeting with Sean? Oh, like I should probably let people know that I'm not coming in for classes. Oh, yeah, like Sean will totally be understanding about that. Just send him an email. I mean, I think everybody, everybody would be understanding about that sort of thing, of course. How's everybody else? Yeah, everybody doing all right? Well, I'll probably give it just one more minute. I, I, it looks like we're going to have like a small math club, but that's okay because then we can sort of get more intimate with the cube and, uh, 
I'm not too surprised because <laughs> we should call this math club the bait and switch because uh, our, uh, our I, I feel really bad for our speaker because she was, uh, was going to speak to us for two weeks and she just kept having these awful technical difficulties. So hopefully I can get her back uh, when things come back online for her. So. All right. So that being said, let's talk about, uh, uh, and uh, Stephen, uh, are you, um, are you Leo's daughter's friend? Well, <laughs> you'll have to reply. I, I, I didn't know if it was a, I, there, there's a, a younger student that was going to come see this too, but so, uh, I am curious uh, of you all out there. How many of you can um, can solve a, a Rubik's cube? I can solve the three by three, the tetrahedron, the two by two. Used to be able to solve the four by four, but I have since long since forgotten how. I have. So how do you know how to do that? Did you did you find like a solution on the internet or some business like this? For the two by two, actually, I would argue the tetrahedron is the easiest. That one I figured out on my own. Two by two figured out on my own. 3x3 three three, I figured that out for the most part, but it was the, the top layer that was giving me trouble. So actually getting all the, the yellow pieces into the same plane. Once mm -hmm. I got that, the 4x4 four four is similar. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's a difference between the odds and the evens, but yeah, it can be overcome. So this thing right here, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on this, but, but what I'm going to talk about will apply and it, it's basic it's some basic group theory but it'll it'll apply to, to any cube so the the same ideas go along so uh i am going to talk like and i know that at least two of you have seen all this group theory stuff but i'm gonna i'm gonna take it kind of from the beginning and so uh if you have we're going to talk about the notion of a of a group and a group is just a, uh, is a, is a mathematical structure uh, that has stuff in it uh, and uh, like maybe numbers or objects or functions or something like this. And there's a way to put things together in the, um, in the group and create something new. So what it means to be a group is a group is a non-empty set. So it's just a bunch of things. We'll call G uh, equipped with an operation. And what I mean by that is a way to combine two things in G. So for all x, y, and z uh, in G, we have number one, x combined with y is in G. So when you combine two things in the group, it's still in the group. Whatever operation you have must be associative. Um, Uh, there's a magic element called the identity. And sometimes, sometimes we just call that one. The identity is something you can combine with anything and it, it leaves it alone. And for all X and G, there is a Y in G such that x equals y equals y times x is this mysterious identity. So a group is basically a collection of things where you can put them together and you get something new in the group that follows a couple of rules, right? So for example, the integers with the operation of addition is a group. Because what happens when you add two integers? 
you get another integer, right? You don't get pi, you don't get one half. When you add two integers, it's still an integer. So that's that first property that it's closed. Uh, adding integers is associative. One plus two plus three is the same thing as one plus two plus three. Uh, and there's an identity element that leaves every integer alone, namely zero, because when you add zero to anything, it doesn't do anything. Uh, and every integer has uh, something that gets it back to zero. If you add negative five to five, you get zero. If you add seven to negative seven, you get zero. But let's go down to brass tacks. Let R be the set of rearrangements on the Rubik's Cube. This is a group, and my operation is just composing, uh, composing the, uh, the operations that I do. So for example, I might call this move X, and I might call this move Y. And so X, Y looks like that, right? Notice that when I do two moves on the Rubik's Cube, I just get a bigger scramble on the Rubik's Cube, right? Um, doing, the, uh, doing the scrambles is an associative operation because it's essentially function composition. I'm not gonna worry too much about that here. Uh, here's the identity. What do you do to leave the cube alone? Just don't do anything to it, right? It's the operation where you do nothing. And every operation has an inverse because all you have to do is no matter what you do, X and Y, just do them opposite order in the opposite direction and you'll get back to where you started. Uh, in fact, the fact that everything has an inverse means that any cube that you haven't taken apart with a screwdriver can be resolved again, right? So for example, if I do this move, then to unsolve it, I just run it in reverse in the opposite direction. So this is a group and groups have structure on them. And the first time I ever solved a Rubik's Cube, one of these things, uh, I was a, a graduate student and I was kind of a lame duck. I was, I was about to graduate and I didn't have much else to do. So I figured, well, I'm getting a PhD in math. I should be able to figure this out. So I actually sat down with a pencil and piece of paper and figured out how to do it. And what I'm gonna do in this talk is I, I'm going to show you some practical group theory. I'm gonna actually do some computations with uh, some elements of the group and, uh, and, and, and give you the tools to where you can solve this yourself. So, uh, and let me say that there has to be, a, <laughs> there probably has to be a practical plan of attack in getting this because if you scramble a cube at random, um, what are the chances that you unscramble it at random? It's, it's very slim. Uh, number of arrangements on the cube uh, is actually 11 factorial times 8 factorial times 3 to the 8th times 2 to the 12th which is somewhere around 4.3 times 10 to the 19th. So there's 4.3 times 10 to the 19th arrangements on the cube without taking it apart. By the way, if you take it apart and just put it back together any way you want it, it multiplies that number by 12. If you put a, how many of you have seen, uh, have you guys seen the, the Ruby's cubes that have pictures on them, right? So instead of just colors like this, it'll have like a design on it or a picture. That multiplies the number of combinations by, I believe it's uh, uh, 4,096, something like that. So um, it can get more complicated. So just to give you a perspective, 4.3 times 10 to the 19th, that's, that's smaller than Avogadro's number if you've had chemistry, but it's still a very, very big number. Uh, so just to give you some perspective to how big this number is, if I gave 300 million people one of these cubes that was scrambled, so basically almost every uh, man, woman, and child in the United States, if I gave them a Rubik's Cube 
like this and I said go and they all started scrambling it and every person in the line all 300 million of them got a new combination every second but they all got different things nobody gets any combination than anybody else does so all 300 million of these people are getting a different combination every second and if you could have a giant computer recording all the combinations that they had like cataloging it so all 300 million people getting a new combination every second a big computer's cataloging it and you do this for 40 years 24 hours a day then at the end of that 40 years you will have you will have gone through about eight tenths of one percent of the number of combinations on the cube so it's going to take more than just luck to figure out how to do this so um, let me let me do something uh, sort of group theory type to sort of uh, show you probably mostly for Stephen because I think I've shown <laughs> the other two of this uh, at one point. So here's kind of a thought question that has to do with groups. Suppose I do something to this cube. So this is a solved cube. Suppose I scramble it somehow, right? Uh, and I'm going to scramble it. Um, and whatever scramble I do, I do it again and again and again and again. So I do something, scramble it, scramble it again, scramble it again, doing the same scramble pattern. Will I ever come back to being in the original pristine state? Well, we can check it. <laughs> Here's one scramble I could do. How about that? Right, that's kind of a boring scramble. But if you notice, one, two, three, four. And I'm back, right? Now, that may be, seem a little bit silly, and in fact it is, but let's, let's look at something more complicated. What if, I, what, what if I make this move here, like that? I'll call that my scramble. So my single scramble is to go down like this and over like this, and then I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again, and again, and again. And again, and my question is, is are we ever going to come back to our nice pristine uh, place in the world? So anybody got any opinions on that? Feels like we should. Yes, it does feel like you should, right? But here's the thing that concerns me. If you notice every now and then, I get a cross like there and every so often i get all four corners right like now so every so often i get across every so often i get the, uh, four corners but here's what concerns me i see these patterns coming and then they go away and i wonder if i might not be in something like a little eddy right just kind of swirling around and around like being in a you know like uh, being in like a, a a drain or something you know should it come back or am i stuck forever i don't know the answer so i can't answer <laughs> Seems well like i know the answer too as a matter of fact and the answer is despite the fact that this seems to this seems to come and go and you know try to reorganize and then not reorganizing as a matter of fact it eventually comes back always not just for that scramble but for any scramble and here's the reason that you can show that this is true uh why is it the case that scrambles come back and this is uh this this is part of the sort of the nice thing uh, about the Rubik's Cube. So here's the reason why scrambles come back. So suppose I do that first scramble, All right? Uh, I'm gonna call this a scramble. It's just a symbol that, that maybe it, 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 uh, it meant going uh, X, Y, like I did, going right side and then down or whatever, but it can mean anything I want. Then I did it twice. Then I did it three times. Then I did it four times. Then I did it five times, etc. 
I agree. Now that makes an infinite list of scrambles, right? That's an infinite list of scrambles. But there's only finitely many ways to rearrange the cube. I mean, I think we can all agree that it's a very large number, but even if I had a screwdriver and I took this apart, there's only finitely many ways to put it together. So this list that I have has to repeat because there's infinitely many things in that list, but there's only finitely many things it can be. So there's some point where it's say SM and then later it's SM plus K, right? And these two have to equal at some point, right? At some point, you have to get a repetition, right? And so that means scrambling at n time, m times is the same thing as scrambling at m plus k times. Now unscramble this by using the inverse, that is go backwards. And if you go back to s zero, that's where we started. This is s to the k. And so what we've shown is if I scramble forward far enough, it will resolve the cube if I started with the cube solved in the first place. Everybody okay with that? Let me also point out one of the things that makes doing the cube difficult is if I call this, okay, so, so look at the colors here. If I call this move X, right, and I call this move Y, Here's what I get when I go X, Y. See what that looks like? Here's what I get when I go Y, X. Oops, different. What that means is not only is this complicated, but the order in which you do things matters. Uh, this is what makes the Rubik's Cube a little bit harder to solve. So how do you solve it? Well, uh, to solve it, the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to draw you a map. Uh, so here's my map. Um, that's it, ain't it? There we go. So uh, I am going to map the Rubik's Cube because there are two kinds, there are two kinds of blocks that I'm going to classify on the Rubik's Cube. Uh, I'm going to call the corner blocks, I, 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 I number those by capital letters in the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, like that. And those, those blocks are the ones that have three colors on them. And then I have another kind of block that only has two colors. I call those side blocks. Uh, they're, the, they're the ones up, up in the top in the middle. Notice there are eight corner blocks and there are 12 side blocks. And so on my cube map on the top there, I've, I've numbered these, A, B, C, D. I've, uh, I just map them in a certain way. Uh, and on the bottom, I've oriented that. And I, I'm gonna, I'll get to that in a moment. But it's important now probably for us to do uh, some computation. So if you remember that trick I just did where I turned the cube and I got back to where I started uh, after, by the way, 105 times. Let, let's, let's kind of do this. Um, let me give you some basic moves for the cube. Um, here we go. Basic cube moves. These are the only ones I need cube moves. These are the only ones I need for the purpose of this talk. You can expand this and be more fancy if you like. Uh, R, this means right clockwise. And when I say right, uh, I'm going to do this from my point of view. This is the right side. Uh, oh, good. It looks right to you as well. This is my right side. And clockwise means if I'm facing the right side, so right clockwise would be this way from my perspective, okay? Um, I'm gonna use the down move, which is down clockwise. 
and down is perhaps what you think it is. It's down and then clockwise, it's like that. Uh, from the perspective of looking at it, it's clockwise. Um, front, uh, F is front clockwise. And right prime is right counterclockwise. So when you see a, a prime, that means instead of going clockwise, you go counterclockwise. Now, what I did in my demonstration was in order, uh, well, let's see, I did this. I did right prime, down prime. So I did right counterclockwise first and then down. So this is where I, I'm, I'm keeping in, in terminology with modern cube language. This means, this notation means I first turn right. This, for my hands, what I mean is I first turn right clockwise and then down, uh, or I'm sorry, right counterclockwise and then down clockwise. Now let me let me show you what to do on the map on the cube. Let's see here. So I want to so I want to record if you look look from the perspective of this, imagine that you take that block on top and you turn the right side counterclockwise and then the downside counterclockwise. In fact, uh, if you want to, if it's more convenient for you so you can keep it up there because I'm not the world's best at going back and forth, uh, you might want to screenshot my little map here if you like. But let's go back to uh, the whiteboard here. So if I do, unfortunately, if I make this move, to do the computation, I, I write down what's going on in the other direction. Uh, so actually what I do is I do, why do I do it this way? Because in the notation that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do my computations from right to left like you would do in a pre-algebra class or something like that when you're doing fun function composition. So for example, if I take sine of x squared or the square root of x squared plus one, what do you do? You evaluate what's inside there first and then you take the square root of it. And unfortunately, I know it's really stupid because the notation for your hands, you read it left to right, the notation for doing the computation, you go the other way. Okay, so let's see what happens to the corners when I turn right counterclockwise. The corners involved here are B, C, G, and F, right? And so when I turn the corner right counterclockwise, then it looks like B goes to C, C goes to G, G goes to F, and F goes to B, okay? So in my notation, right counterclockwise, I'm gonna go B, C, uh, uh, right, B, C, G, F. And what happens when down goes counterclockwise? Well, when down goes counterclockwise, I get, let's see, clock, uh, and counterclockwise. So that's from the perspective, imagine that you're lying up under that cube and looking up at it. It looks like it goes C, goes to D, goes to H, goes to G, which goes back to C. So in this notation, uh, C, D, H, G. I believe that was right. Okay, before we move on, uh, 
I want to make uh, sure you guys understand that. So what this means is when I, what, what this is doing to the corners is right moves the corner B to C, or right prime moves the corner, corner B to corner C, corner C to corner G, corner G to corner F, and F cycles back to B. And if you look at the map, that's what happens. And then down prime moves the corner C to D, D to H, H to G, G to C. Okay, is everybody okay with that? Don't be shy if you're not. And what we do is, some of you have done this kind of computation before, but what we do is we do like function composition and go through this. Notice that some corners are left out of this. Uh, for example, I never see the corner F and I never see, I, I'm sorry, I never see the corner A and I never see the corner E, for example. So I'm gonna start here with B. My choice is arbitrary, but it's just alphabetically the first that's there. B goes to C. C goes to, uh, so B goes to C, and then in the first step, and then C goes to D, so B ends up at D. So B travels to C by doing the right prime, and then it travels on to D by doing the other one. Now, where does D go? Pick up where you left off. There's no D, right prime doesn't mess with D, but D goes on to H in the second move. There's no H in the first move, but H goes to G in the second move. Uh, G goes to F, and there's no F in the second move. And F goes to B. F goes to B, and there's no B here. By the way, let's see. C, D. Did I leave any letters out? Are there any letters missing? Looks like C is missing. Yes, it looks like C is missing, but let's check out what happens to C. C goes to G and then on back to C. So C actually does a little dance. It goes somewhere else and comes back to where it started. All right? And so this is what's happening to the corners. Now, what's happening to the sides? Um, let's, let's look at the map again and see what's happening here. With the sides, if I do, um, if I turn the right counterclockwise, it looks like the sides, the side number two goes to where five is, five goes to where 10 is, 10 goes to six, and six goes to two, All right? So, let's see, down prime, right prime, just like we did before. And so let's see what we have. Uh, right prime uh, on the, the sides is 5, 10, 6, 2. Actually, it doesn't matter where I started. 5 goes to 10, 10 goes to 6, 6 goes to 2, and 2 goes back to 5. And down prime uh, is 12. 11, 10, 9. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, like I said, just holler if any of this escapes. So there's a lot of numbers left off here, right? I don't see a 1 or a 3 or a 4, etc. So I'm going to start with the smallest number I see, which is 2. And where does 2 go? 2 goes to 5. Okay. And there's no 5 in the second, so it's done at 5. Where does five go? So pick up where you left off. Five goes to 10 and then to nine. So it ends up at nine. Where does nine go? There's no nine in the first one, so it goes on to 12 in the second. Where does 12 go? There's no 12 in the first, so it goes on to 11. Where does 11 go? It goes to 10. Where does 10 go? It goes, looks like to six. Uh, where does six go? It goes to two. And let's see, have I used all the numbers? Looks like I've used all the numbers this time. Everybody agree? So at the end of the day, when I do that move, when I do this, what it does is it moves five of the corners around, leaves C alone, sort of. Uh, and it moves, I guess, seven 
of the sides around. Now, how many times do you think you have to do this move before the corners are fixed? Hundred and five. No, just the corners. Just the corners. So this would be uh, fifteen. Well, you're technically correct, but I mean geographically to solve it, you only need five, correct? You guys okay with that? Because really, B goes, if you look at what happens, B goes to D, D goes to H, H goes to G, G goes to F, and F goes back to B. So you'll have to move B one, two, three, four, five places to get back. So every five times, the corner should be solved. Everybody agree with that? Wouldn't they be rotated though? Well, I'll get to that in a moment. But every five times the corner should be solved geographically and every seven times the side should be solved correct so let's let's try that so that means every five the corners are right every seven the sides are right so it looks like every 35 they're both right let's try one two three four five six seven eight nine 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what we have here, folks, is a solved cube. <laughs> Doesn't look like it, does it? But if you look at this cube more closely, notice that every side piece is correct, all of them, right? They're, they're all correct. You got the cross going all the way around is correct. Uh, of course, the corner pieces look a little bit wonky, but they are all geographically correct. For example, what goes here in this corner is the red, yellow, green, and that's exactly what we've got. And we've got in this corner, what goes here is the white, red, green, and that's exactly what we get. This cube in a certain sense is solved because it is geographically correct. So when I did that move 35 times, it's like a mystic force from above took all of these strange corners and twisted them 120 degrees. How many times do I have to twist something 120 degrees for it to come back to where it was? Three times. And three times 100, or three times 35 is 105, which is why it took me that many times to make the cube look right again. So, um, this, I illustrate this because this shows the way that this kind of uh, writing this notation this way can help you solve the cube. Uh, and I also do this for another reason. It shows that just moving the pieces back to their geographical place uh, is, is, is not good enough. Uh, you have to worry about orientations. So let me, uh, let me help you out a little bit here. Something here, I'll kind of get this in solid position here. So my reasoning for saying 15 was that doing that one of these moves uh, three times would um, do a permutation on the orientations of the corners. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that's right. So, so effectively, when I did that move 35 times, what I did was I left everything in place and I took those however many corners there were, there were probably like six of them, and turned them. In fact, do you remember in, in this first thing, you see how C stays in its place geographically? Uh, in fact, you can see this right here, just in the one move by itself. Uh, let's see, right. The cube C is this one here, and what happens to this one is it moves over there and then back, but it's misoriented, right? Because originally, uh, the white was facing out this way, and now, even though it's in the uh, right place, the white's facing the wrong way. 
So that shows that we've got a we've got to deal with um, we've got to deal with orientations a little bit too. So let me. Uh, That's a quick question. Sure. So just make sure I understand the last bit. So if you did it 15 times, the corners would all be in the right place with the right orientation. Is that? Uh, that is correct. Every okay. 15 times, the corners would be in the right place with the right orientation. That's okay. absolutely right. Okay, good, good. Um, so the orientation, so let me, uh, let me do kind of a, 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 better, uh, a better map here. Let me move on to this page here. There we go. So uh, and let me uh, let me do one of them and then go to the cube map and show you what I uh, are the right move. This is the move uh, B, F, uh, G, C. That's what it does on the corners. And it goes 2, 6, 10, 5 on the sides. And you'll see in a moment that I picked the orientations the way that I should because they're a little bit convenient. So. What I did now look at the at the bottom part of the map uh, in in the kind of blue black ink. I've oriented the corners. Notice that the corners require three numbers for orientation: zero, uh, and you have to have a zero, one, and two on every one. And this sort of this sort of uh, signifies how many times that you've rotated 120 degrees and in what direction. The side pieces only have two colors and so they're oriented zero and one and I noticed that I put zeros across the top. Now let's look at right clockwise uh, which takes two to six to ten to five. So imagine turning the right side on top clockwise. Let's do the corner orientation and the way we do it is we see to get the orientation, we see where the number zero goes to on the next cube. So for example, look at the block B, which is the upper, upper right block. B goes to the block F when you rotate it clockwise. Where does the zero go? Where does the zero block go? It goes to the block that is now numbered what? Can you guys tell? one because zero goes to that opposite face you can't tell which is one so i would do this notation here b goes to f oriented one f goes to g let's see uh, what happens with f goes to g uh the zero on f goes to the block on g numbered what Which number are we looking at? Okay, so now now we have the block F going to G, right? Yeah. So the zero on F is on the side facing up. And so where does that end up uh, when it goes into the G position? Two, right. Yes, it goes to two. So that's a two. G goes to C. Let's see what we get here. Um, the zero on G is on the bottom and it goes to the one on the C block and the zero on the C block goes to two. So we got one then two. So this is one and two. By the way, when you add up the orientations, what do you get? you get, uh, actually you get six, don't you? Which is a multiple of three. Okay. 
We'll fix the Sounds other good. one. Let's see, 2, 6, 10, 5. So you will see how clever I am now because I think you will. <laughs> um, When you do that same uh, rotation on the orientations for the sides, notice that the orientations are all zero because when two goes to six, the zero goes to the zero. And then when six goes to 10, the zero goes to zero and so forth and so on. So I sort of set that one up so that the orientation is all zero. Like that. And you can catalog all of these moves, right? Um, and do the orientations as well. Now, let me give you a, a move, and let's let's kind of do a, a computation, which uh, I hope I've got the. Uh, uh, so. Here's one strategy. If you look at this Rubik's cube, which has been scrambled up a little bit here, let me uh, let me make one a little bit more interesting here. So, one of the things that I don't sort of cover that hopefully you would have to practice yourself is getting just one side, right? Just just one layer uh, with you know perfect degrees of freedom, so to speak. Uh, this actually does take a little practice. But you have a lot of um, you have a lot of freedom here. So let's see here. Let me get this into position here. I think that's right. And where are you? So let's suppose that you that you've acquired the skill to get one side. And I do mean one side correctly, and I'll show you what I mean. I don't just mean I don't, I don't just mean all red here, which it is, but I also mean that it matches these colors as well. And now, of course, you can get it to where the middle color matches as well. So you have like on the second row. Now, one thing that you might do is you, you want to get the second row, right? Well, let me show you this, this move here uh, that would be useful. Uh, yeah, and it's shorter. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to write this down and we'll do the computation here. If you do the move, um, down prime, R prime, right, down, right, uh, no, I'm doing the wrong one. Uh, let's try again. If you do the move down prime, right prime, and by the way, I came up with this by doing, by reverse engineering the process. We're going to, we're going through the front door on this process, but I, I did it sort of back when I first did it. D F D prime F prime. So, um, Now let me let, let me remind you that you do this in reverse order, right? So the first thing that you write here is you do F prime, which is D C B A. That's the F prime part. And you should do them all in reverse order because of this crazy notation uh, until you get uh, to the end, which I will note when we get there. Uh, I got DHGC uh, ABCD that's F G uh, CGHD BFGC Um, 
uh, CGHD. Uh, CGFB. And finally, uh, unfortunately, BCGF. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, six, seven, eight. And this last one here is, um, this last one here is the uh, D prime. Now, what happens when you, when you work this out, okay? Well, remember, let's go from right to left. Where does A go? To itself. Right, because A doesn't even get any action until it's all the way here. A goes to B, there's no B here, and then B goes back to A, so A ends up at itself. Everybody cool with that? Where does B go? Well, B goes, does it go to itself? I don't know if it does or not. Uh, it goes to C, that goes to G. Well, let's see, where does B go? It starts way over here at D prime, it goes to C, then to G, then to H, then nothing here, then H goes on to D, and then D to A, and then A to D. So it ends up at D. Is that, uh, you guys okay with that? It was something in the chat here, I think. 